Hey everyone, it's Meg. I just wanted to start this episode with a huge, huge thank you to our fans. We are all so excited to welcome you to Series 2. This show is a labour of love for me and the whole We Are Not Alive crew, and we wouldn't have been able to make it this far without you. Secondly, if you stick around after the credits, you're going to hear a preview for Electromancy. If you like fantasy, if you like the Kingmaker histories, you're definitely going to want to check it out. And now that that's out of the way, enjoy the very first episode of the Kingmaker Histories Series 2. Before we begin this next chapter of the history of the Kingmaker, I would like to briefly zoom out and summarise the wider context of Europe's history at the time. England and Germany had been involved in a seemingly never-ending naval arms race for almost 20 years by 1911. Meanwhile, Russia had been ravaged by a series of earthquakes, putting more pressure on the country's already quite unhappy farmers. France, the VSR's western neighbour and fellow republic, had been navigating new alliances with the old guard of imperial monarchies. And of course, in the VSR itself, April 20th, 1911 would be forever known as Glasregennacht, the night of the reigning glass, because of the devastating explosion in Crystal City. Many scholars cite this as the greatest turning point in the VSR's entire history since the February Revolt. Fewer will tell you that while the president was declaring a state of emergency and the people of the city were panicking, Colette Geis, Eisen Eyer and Telesfall Winterlich were being held at gunpoint by four men who each had a very personal axe to grind. Well, gentlemen, anything you'd like to say for yourself? <sighs> Wonderful work as usual, Eisen. What the hell does that mean? It was Colette's fault this time. Guys, shut up. I think I can take them. You sure? Aren't you still in your cooldown period? I'm sure. The Kingmaker's already going all flickery again. I think you two bickering is giving it secondhand energy. Oh, why not? Well, let's murder the Chief of Police and the Minister of Road Maintenance while we're here. Do you want to die? Whoa, whoa. What's going on with her hair? She's got a weapon. I'm taking the shot. <laughs> what the hell? Good work, Eisen. I guess you found a second wind. Well, I didn't do it, Anne. It was at that moment that Babyface, Gottlieb, LaBelle and Moretz all suddenly lost their guns, drawn away by the magic of a much more powerful artificer. Section 16 of the Arrest Act strictly forbids execution before the suspect has been tried by a judge. I'll take it from there, Chief Gottlieb. Following the explosion at Crystal Castle, the President had moved swiftly to declare a state of emergency. From their expansive barracks to the south of Crystal City, the Valorian army had mobilised, led by their illustrious leader, Commander Klaus Holtzmann. Holtzmann's father was a decorated veteran of the Revolutionary War, and he had been following in his father's footsteps for his entire life. He was the Wunderkind of the Grasshoff Institute, with a great repertoire of spells in not only industrial artifice, but also textile, wood, and masonry, as well as a light dabbling in handicraft. Frank LaSalle's, British ambassador to the VSR from 1908 to 1909, described Holtzman as fastidious, cordial, but unfailingly serious. Holtzman was, as always, accompanied by his assistant, Auguste Mandel. Sir. What do we have here? Hmm. These are the supposed anarchists responsible for the attack on the Houses of Parliament? It would seem so, sir. Would you believe it was an accident? I'd like to, certainly, but we do have to follow up on all perceived threats to national security. Either way, soon enough our men will have completed a full investigation of the event. But I'm less interested in that. and more interested in the fact that you're... All here. John Schaefer, 
Six counts of racketeering, four counts of blackmail, three counts of assault with magic. Francois Lebel. Two counts of illegal gambling, got out on a technicality, both times. Colette Geis, judging by that blue glow coming through your hair, I think we can finally close the book on what weapon you used to dispatch your former employer. More or less. Maxim Moritz. It would be easier to list the things he hasn't been charged with. And you. Mandel, do you recognize this man? Of course, sir. Eisen Eyer, wanted for smuggling, fraud, grand larceny, petty larceny, B&D, assault. Yes, but before that, he fought in the revolution. He was the former first strength division engineer, in fact. Disabled the arm brilliant, pioneered the Kleist technique, designed the first fully operational reverse gravity charm, all before the age of fatty. <laughs> My father trained alongside you. He was a mentalist, but his stories about you inspired me to enroll at the Grasshoff Institute and take up artifice. My whole life I've always wanted to meet you and shake your hand. And now that I finally got the chance, I just wanted to say... Oh, you're too kind. <laughs> you are an unbelievable disappointment. Uh, what? You fought for this nation. You were one of the best engineers we had with an undeniably brilliant mind. Yet as soon as the revolution was over, you abused your position and ultimately abandoned it. People like you make me sick. Not the first time I've heard that. <sighs> and you? Sorry, who are you? Me? I'm just a chauffeur. That's, uh, tell us for Winter Lynch, sir. Fraud, smuggling, forgery, assault. They started it. Our records indicate he used to work for the DeRosier family. Hmm. On the kitchen staff. Oh, thank God. Well, it's been a pleasure, gentlemen, Miss Geis. Let's round them up and take them in, shall we? Take the van into police lockup and take all of them in for observation. What? Now you listen here. No, you listen to me. I don't care that you're the chief inspector, and I don't care that you're the minister of road maintenance. President Rothbard has declared a state of emergency, giving me full ability to make arrests in my discretion. If you do not comply, my men will not hesitate to shoot. Commander Holtzman, sir, if I may... You may not. If the explosion truly was an accident, as your friend the murderer has claimed, the investigation will reveal that, and you will be allowed to go free. Until such time, you'll be put under observation at FKA. Hands where I can see them, please. As soon as that fateful acronym left Holtzman's lips, a cold chill fell over the group. FKA, short for Forschung's Complex de Army, was the highest security prison in the Republic, often called the Alcatraz of the Rhineland in more recent years. While Eichhorn State Prison, located in Crystal City's Justice Quarter, was where most of the country's criminals were sent, FKA was reserved for suspected terrorists, anti-government dissidents, and those convicted of high treason. While the practice wasn't exactly on the books at the time, it was something of an open secret that being held at FKA meant one had a high chance of being subjected to what we in the modern day might call special interrogation methods. Thank you for your cooperation. Now, gentlemen, if you'd be so kind as to get in the transport vehicle... Uh, no, Miss Geis, not you. Not me? Uh, no. <laughs> You'll be coming with me. We have special containment procedures for people in your situation, but first, we're going to need to do a few tests. Joy, so where do you want me? Ultimately, that's sensitive information. But in the short term, you'll be riding with Mendel and I. I, uh... I assure you this is all for the sake of formality, Miss Guys. We'll only be holding you and your friends until our investigation concludes. You have my word as head of the Valorian army. We'll be fine, Colette. This isn't our first rodeo, believe us. The journey from Crystal City to the FKA was long and arduous. They were escorted by armoured train to the country's far south, about 15 miles from the border with Switzerland. Unlike comparable military prisons of the time, such as the Cherche Midi in France, the FKA was strategically built as far from human habitation as possible. 
The intimidating stone monolith stood atop a cliff, terraformed out of the alpine foothills by powerful nature magic and only directly accessible via dirigible. You don't believe for a second that we're just here for observation, do you? Absolutely not. You have a plan to get us out of here, I hope. Uh, what can on it? Though Holtzman gave his word, that proved to be ultimately worthless. As Telesphore expected, they were not simply going to be kept for observation. Once they were brought inside by the guards, they were stripped of their belongings and had their fingerprints and photographs taken for the prison's records. Name? Eisen. Ayer. Your real name, please? That is my real name. It's on my birth certificate and everything. I've got two younger brothers named Bronze and Silver. The old man wanted us to have names that sounded durable. Is that a joke? No, no. He's telling the truth. Did anyone ask you? All right, eyes in. Put your fingers in the ink, then press them onto the paper. Tilt your head to the side. Eisen did as he was told. One of the other guards produced a glass vial full of a milky, shimmering purple liquid, which was administered into Eisen's ear via eyedropper. All right, get out of here. Who's next? Name. Tell us for Winterlich. That's tell us for with a P-H. Winterlich, spelled more or less how it sounds. Fingerprints? They're blank. The, wh the whole page is blank all of a sudden. Sorry, force of habit. Don't screw with it this time. I'll do my best. As for the good neighbours who were brought into the FKA, they were subject to their own unique containment procedure. Fucking care, Sidians. We've got one for Block Zero, boys! Block Zero? Block Zero! Going down! Block Zero! Yay! Telus IV had never considered himself claustrophobic, but once the cell door closed, he felt as if he'd been dropped to the bottom of the ocean without a diving suit. Keep it together, Telus IV. Worst comes to worst, how long can they keep you here? <laughs> You'll outlive all of them. Probably. Several days passed, then the days turned to weeks, Without windows, it was hard for the inmates to tell how much time had passed. After the first few rounds of interrogation from Holtzman's men, it became clear that none of the prisoners taken from Crystal Castle had any useful information. Still, they weren't permitted to leave. Over time, they settled into the routines of incarceration. Rise and shine, are you? Oh, I do your worst. Your end of the side. Maybe if you do that to be enough, I'll start enjoying it. Each prisoner had a solitary cell. They were not allowed exposure to natural sunlight, but every Saturday they were allowed 20 minutes in an indoor enrichment area lit with a small artificial sun lamp. They were given bland, plain meals twice a day and were afforded three hours of exercise on the penal treadmills in Block 10 in accordance with the 1907 Prison Reform Act, which outlawed the use of the incarcerated for free labor, the massive generator powered by the prisoner's footsteps wasn't attached to anything, and was for the most part purely intended to lower morale with its unpleasant, repetitive noises. I just know there's a spell that would make this stupid thing break down. I just have to remember how to cast it. Yeah, and I'm the king of Denmark. Stop embarrassing yourself. Knowing the value of having connections in prison, Eisen had been forced to form an uneasy alliance with Babyface John, Maxim Moretz, and Aaron Gottlieb. 
Francois Labelle had been part of their group as well early on, but four days into his sentence, he was let go due to a supposed lack of evidence. Quiet. Oh, I almost had it. You said that 20 minutes ago. Let it go. You only exhaust yourself faster. How many times do I gotta tell you? There's no way to get around the effects of Lethe Water. Ah, there's no way they found it yet. I know I can cast a deconstruction spell. I know it's in my grimoire. I remember exactly where it was when I wrote it down. The technique's on the tip of my tongue, but I just can't quite get it. Yeah, that's the Lethe Water. That's what it does. It's a powerful potion. Well, I can't just not try and figure a way out. I'm not like the rest of you. Bold of you to assume we've all been sitting on our hands. I have it on good authority that an old friend of mine is about to be brought in here. I think when we get a chance to talk to him, his insights might prove quite useful. Finally. See? There you go, Eisen. You can stop wheel spinning now. What was that? I couldn't hear you over the sound of the big wheel spinning. No matter. When my friend arrives in the prison, we'll all rendezvous with him individually so as to be less conspicuous to the guards. I'll speak with him first, and then I imagine he'll want to see Ayer and Schaefer next. You'll know him when you see him, trust me. Moretz's old friend, as it turned out, was a man by the name of Conrad Werner Franchini, a renowned contortionist who had performed for nearly 15 years with Crystal City's legendary Starlight Circus. Few at the time knew about his side business as a criminal escapologist. Franchini was a self-taught flesh crafter and had over time become an adept in the corpofaltung or body folding technique. As Moretz implied, he was a very distinctive looking man. Even in his disguise as a prison guard, one could still tell that he was covered from the neck down in tattoos. Aya? Eisen Aya? Earth to Eisen. Hello? Aye, all right. I heard you the first time. Jeez, when Moretz said you'd be spaced out, he wasn't kidding. You look like shit, man. Ah, oh, thanks. I haven't slept in a month. You're the artificer, Nespa. Mm, I like artificers. I met one who worked with the Minic Circus. He built these clockwork automatons that could dance. They could tell jokes. He even got them to perform the marriage of Figaro for one show. Hell of an act. Side note, is Eisen a nickname that you got after you learn how to control metal, or is it purely a coincidence? If you don't get to the point, I'm going to break your jaw. All right, all right. So, we're going to need you to work your magic. What do you guys call it? Communion. That's nature magic. You're thinking of transmission. Hey, that's the one. Yeah, you're going to need to transmit the supply zeppelin so we can hijack it. Which cell are you in? 16A. But I'm not going to be any use to you when you're pouring that stuff in my ears every day. Aha, that's what you think. Expect a visit from me tomorrow morning. Oh, sinister. I can't wait. See you there. Lord, if you're this snippy at three in the afternoon, I'm going to hate to see you when you first wake up. Oh, piss off. Wait, wait. How much do you know about the layout of this place? I know it like the back of my hand at this point. Why do you ask? When they bring neighbours in here, where do they put them? Block zero, down in the basement. I hear they keep the door sealed to keep light out. The gate's visibility. Stops them from teleporting. There's not even a centimetre of space to slip through. Ah. Now how do you plan on getting in, then? Impossible. Why are you asking me all this, anyway? Moretz didn't say anything about breaking into block zero. That wasn't part of the deal. He didn't. Moretz was, at this time, on the other side of the recreation room, reading a book from the complex's meagre library after having his own conversation with Franchini a few minutes earlier. The first part of his escape plan was going off without a hitch, and Moretz was, for the most part, quite calm. This calm did not last. Ayer, what the hell is wrong with you? Not part of the deal, huh? What's wrong with you? Bring it up! Bring it up! <sighs> Don't make a scene like this, please. I understand why you're angry, but some things are outside the realm of possibility. I'm afraid you'll just have to live with it. Eisen was promptly dragged back to his cell as punishment for his outburst, where he remained for the rest of the night. At some point after his fourth consecutive hour of angrily staring at the wall, he slipped into unconsciousness. He slept uneasily until about five o'clock the next morning when he was awoken by... Rise and shine, beautiful. Uh, Today's no. the day. No, piss off. No, I'm not going. Yes, you are. No, 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 I'm not. 
not. Suit yourself, but mm. the Rex won't like it if I don't get you out as well. That Zeppelin ain't going to fly itself. Oh. Come on, mm. this takes two seconds. I'll scream. I don't care, because I can be done out of your hair in the time it'll take the guards to show up. Side note, you have gorgeous hair. What do you condition it with? Uh, leave me alone. Do you mind if I... Yes, I bloody mind. Ow! What did you do with my ear? That was it. Oh. That was all I had to do. Aren't you glad it's over with? Oh, did you just pop my eardrum? Nothing of the sort. I just closed up your ear canal. Make sure you give that side of your head to the guard when he comes around. The lethal water should slide right out. You're welcome. Frankini took a grand bow before stretching himself almost entirely flat and sliding out through the bars of the cell door. Eisen spent the next hour pretending to be asleep. His mind raced with thoughts, thoughts which he hadn't been able to shake since he'd been brought to the FKA. He spent much of his time playing out alternate scenarios in his head, agonizing over things he should have done earlier. He imagined Telesphore trapped in an oubliette, Colette either dead or locked up in some similarly high-security women's prison, and Ariadne presumed dead but likely still at large. Everything considered, he wasn't sure if breaking out would be worth it. Wake up, Ayer. I'm coming in. Ah, uh, do your worst. Tilt your edge to the side. No funny business today, all right. Understood. I mean it. You've already had your enrichment room privileges revoked. You pull another stunt like what you did with Moritz yesterday, and you'll get a full 24 hours on the treadmill. Here's your food. When the guard left, Eisen decided to test the efficacy of the spell Frankini had cast on his ear by attempting to bend a spoon. Nothing happened. Stupid bloody clown. Maybe deaf in one ear, and for what? The dose they gave you yesterday is likely still wearing off. Moron. For fuck's sake. I know, I know. A bowl of porridge, weird place to hide, but needs must, am I right? I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what they all say. Get in line. Anyway, I'm here to bust you out for real this time. The ear thing. Ah, now that I'm thinking about it. Hold on. Uh... There. Your ear works again. You're welcome. Anyway, the ear thing was just the first step, you know, just to ensure you regain all your mental faculties in case of a fight. That was the easy part. Oh, and I guess whatever you're about to do to me now is the hard part. Yep. I'm gonna fold you. I would rather you didn't. It's totally safe. Look, look. He reached into his pocket and pulled out three very small folded shapes that looked like paper cranes. I've already done Gottlieb. He's right. And Babyface John. Hurts like hell for a second, but you get over it. And here's Moretz. Would you stop stalling and fold him already? See? Safe. Mm, I'd still rather not. <sighs> Look, Eisen, I get it. You've got your buddy down in block zero. You're sad we can't bring him with. But I realistically just can't get into those cells. And Moretz would rather have one of you than neither. Ah, oh, you've done enough for me, Frankini, really. I mean, with all due respect, I'm not following Moretz out of here anymore if he thinks that my business partner is expendable. I mean, by all means, continue your prison break without me. Once I get my magic back, I'll get out of here and I'll break Winter Lich out myself. Whatever you say, my man, but you know what they say about safety in numbers. You're just one person. You'll probably die. Ah, oh, whatever happens, happens. Admirable sentiment. I'm still going to fold you. Oh, come on! With Eisen added to his collection, Frankini picked up the plate and tray from Eisen's breakfast and carried it out of the cell. What are you doing with that plate, Conrad? Oh, Kleiner missed a cell when he was going around picking the plates up. Real sloppy work. You should dock his pay. You're sure it was Klein? On my mother's eyes. All right. Good catch, Conrad. Frankini carried the plate to the prison kitchen, then, after leaving it on the counter, took a detour through the kitchen's back doors which led him to Block 15, which was, among other things, the location of the prison's storage room. This was the next step in the plan. Alright boys, we are likely to have much time before they notice you're all missing. We're just below the roof so I can squeeze you through it and stretch your woods so you can use me like a ladder. Get any of your valuables I think you'll need, 
Then be ready to go. Got it. The things that were confiscated from the group of men when they were taken in included, but were not limited to, Gottlieb's mechanical hand, including gun attachment. <sighs> Still works. Babyface John's pistol. Now we're talking. Maxim Moretz's hat, cufflinks and glasses. Thank God. Eisenhower's brass goggles, leather gloves and, of course... No, oh, I've almost got it. Okay, so the potion hasn't worn off yet. Could someone get my wrench down for me? It's up there. It's, it's at the top. I can't reach it. No problemo. <laughs> Thanks. They also took the opportunity to fill their pockets with any other contraband that they thought they might need for their prison break. Mostly watches, rings, cufflinks, and any loose change that hadn't already been taken by the guards. Speaking of the guards, it was around this time they noticed that four of their prisoners were missing. Nobody heard anything. It's like they somehow just walked out. Well, when was the last time anyone saw them in their cells? Well... Conrad picked up a dirty plate from Aya's cell and he didn't mention anything. Wait a minute. Who was on cleanup for Block 16 this morning? Was it Klein? No, it was Hess. I think I know how they were able to get out. All right, gentlemen, there's the Zeppelin. Nobody here has a fear of flying, I hope. Not that you have a choice. I, uh, I'd recommend steering it south of Zurich. Stay the hell out of Crystal City at all costs. Well, I suppose this is where you leave us, then. Seems like it. Listen, Moretz, we're all squared up now, you and me, right? Consider your debts paid. Thank you. Oh, and side note, that invitation you sent me to your nephew's... It didn't take long for the other guards to realise which one of them was an imposter. Fleshcrafters are notoriously difficult to kill, but unfortunately for Frankini, the marksman emerging from the stairwell was an expert shot who gave him no warning. Shit! Let's get out of here! Hold them off! Schaefer, has the leaf water worn off yet? The magic's coming back to me. Yeah. What about you, Ayer? Likewise. Block the bullets. Great. Ow! Shit! Ah! Oh. Ah! Oh. Still rusty, I guess. Leave him! We have to go! The other three are going to the Zeppelin! Stop them! Like hell you will. Eh... Uh. Who's, uh, going to the what now? Were there more people here a second ago, or did I dream that? Come on, Iron, get up. We need you to interface with the airship. You know I learned how to fly a Zeppelin in police training. Oh, well in that case, yeah, screw this guy. Oh, sure, don't wait around for my sake, fellas. There's only a wee bullet in the leg. There was a Zeppelin here at some point, right? Am I going crazy? Whatever. Let's just take Iyer to the infirmary. My head hurts. Eisen woke up a few hours later, handcuffed to a bed in the prison's combined morgue and infirmary, located in Block 1. Eisen's head and right leg ached, but the bullet was gone and his wound had been patched. On the counter next to him was a tray of surgical equipment and a canister of ether that had no doubt been used to keep him under during surgery. He turned his head to see the prison's doctor in the next room, taking a phone call. Quietly and carefully, Eisen opened the ether. You're awake, are you? Good. I'll uncuff you from the table and I'll lead you back to your cell. Shh, 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 there you go. Shh, 
nice and easy. That's it. Nighty night. All right, Doctor, let's see if you have any keys. These could be useful. All right, no cash. Hello. What's this? Eisen held in his hand a book of matches. An idea came to him. Aha, uh -huh. an idea's just come to me. As someone who had worked as an engineer within the Feverite government during the time when the FKA was constructed, Eisen knew that the prison had an automatic failsafe on the cell doors that would activate in case of fire. Once the fire started, every cell door opened and the complex quickly devolved into chaos. Inmates, stay in an orderly line and head to the exit. That's in order. Nothing like a good riot to serve as a distraction. No, where the hell did I put my wrench? Ha <laughs> ha still got it. Through the chaos, Eisen found his way to the lift that led down to Block Zero. Why watch it? Block Zero was in the basement, separate enough from the other cell blocks that the fire wouldn't reach it. The doors were unconnected to the fire alarm, and the guards had abandoned their posts to attempt to control the riot going on above ground. The walls were curved, with a series of heavy concrete doors forming a circle around Eisen as he left the stairwell. To him, it resembled a crypt more than another section of prison. Eisen? Delcy! Oh, thank God. Didn't I tell you I was working on a way out? Ha <laughs> ha now let's take care of this door. Ah, it's too heavy. Uh, they put a potion in my ear to stop me from using magic. It's only just worn off, so I'm, I'm kind of rusty. Plus, I, I got shot earlier, so... Uh, you got shot? In the leg. Non-fatally, of course. The guards were nice enough to get me patched up, but uh, it still hurts. Wait a minute. There's rivets on the outside of this door. Maybe if I can undo the ones on the handle... After Eisen used his wrench to break the lock, Teles4 was able to push the door open from the inside. I'm so glad to see you again. Aye, I bet you're glad to see anything. <laughs> oh, hey, all right, big guy. Uh, I love you too, but I'm recovering from surgery, remember? Right, sorry. Sorry. I'm just so relieved you're here. Ooh, I'm liking the change of facial hair. Oh, stop it. They don't let you have razors down here. Or mirrors, for obvious reasons. No, I'm serious. It works for you. You look like a... A Viking. <laughs> it's kind of sexy. Hmm. Let's agree to disagree. So, how are we getting out of here? Upstairs in the infirmary, there's a body disposal chute. If I remember correctly, it leads down to the valley where a truck comes to pick up the dead and transport them north. Wonderful. We'll have a pile of corpses to break off all. I know I shouldn't be picky, but... Uh... Ah, right, well... Better than nothing. And how do you suppose we get past the guards? Remember the last time you were in Paris? Ah, uh, how could I forget? So if anyone tries to stop us, you go left? And you go right. As one likely would have predicted, Gottlieb, Moretz and Schaefer were long gone by the time Iyer and Winterlich escaped the walls of the FKA. The expression, no honour among thieves, is just as true in the Valorian Socialist Republic as it is elsewhere on Earth. But Eisen's recollection about the body shoot was indeed correct, and once they made it to Block 1, they were able to climb in and slide down the tunnel through the surrounding mountains. Unfortunately, the body collection vehicle had already come and gone by that time, leaving nothing but grass and earth to cushion their landing. 
<coughs> Thanks for breaking my fall. Uh, happy to be of service. From there, they hopped into an empty car on a freight line going north from Zurich to Brussels, stopping in a few Valorian towns on the way through. The two men were bruised, exhausted, and they were unsure of what would come next, but at least they were alive and together again. I hear things are bad in Crystal City, so we'll get off before then. And what do you suppose we do without the van? Or we can walk. As long as we don't run afoul of any mantelopes or carnivorous trees or sinkholes or the National Guard, then we should be fine. What about your leg? You could always carry me. <laughs> Cute, but I have a feeling that won't be sustainable long term. I suppose we could keep train hopping until we get to Ankerstadt. Jenny could fix you up. I'd get me some metal straps and some screws and I could knock up a leg brace in the meantime. Do you think Colette's still alive? Honestly, couldn't he tell you? I suppose we'll just have to stay optimistic. Let's get off here. I see a town. Right there on the other side of that turtle board paddock. Hold my hand and close your eyes. The two of them walked past the farm towards civilization, with Eisen leaning on Telesphore to support his bad leg. The town, as it turned out, was the village of Blathaufen, located on the road between Hunderkopf and Beaupont. They approached the local pub, the boy with apple, hoping to get some food and to get out of the encroaching spring rainstorm. Vigors. Do we have any money? I have. Uh, let's see. I have a half mark and three bruchtile. Oh, that ought to get us, what, half a pint and a baked potato between us. Better than nothing. Better than prison food. Excuse me, mate. Are you waiting to order or are you... Ison? Colette? Colette? So, uh, how was prison? The Kingmaker Histories is a production of We Are Not Alive. This episode was written and audio engineered by Meg Malloy Juton with Foley Design by Jam Wright, and executive production by Henry Galley. Our music comes courtesy of Vivek Abhishek and Kevin McLeod, and our theme was written and performed by Professor Shy Guy. This episode featured, in order of appearance, David Alt as the historian, Graham Rowett as Moretz, Josh Rubino as Telesfor, Takai Nazir as Eisen, Blythe Renee as Colette, Richie Ammons as Babyface John, B.K. Dawson as Gottlieb, Bradley Gareth as Holtzman, Newton Shottlecotty as Mandel, and Lou Sutcliffe as Frankini, with additional voices by Zane Schacht, Roscoe Brahman, and Matt Baker. If you'd like to support the show, visit the links in the show notes. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in two weeks. These two mages we've just saved, Tessic and Donovan, I need to know, are they worth the trouble? You've seen their files. They're prodigies, both of them. Bryn, give me back 
my book. Okay, talking a little loudly about this stuff. Hem, there was nothing suspicious about the interaction until you said that. She could have been talking about, like, a textbook. Hello, Electro Dancers. For the record, I think all five of us together is inherently kind of suspicious. At this I point. see how it is. Happy to hang with me when we're imprisoned by evil necromancers in the distant past. But once I save your ass, it's back to the cool kids' table. To be fair, I didn't have any choice but to hang out with you then. That's what imprisoned we means. We need a normal thing to plan and talk about and work towards so that everything isn't schoolwork and memory wipes and time travels and monsters and death. Electromancy, a fantasy adventure show now available wherever you get your podcasts.